going to talk about Suzanne K. Langer's Philosophy in a New Key, which is a 1942 monograph that was um, written by um, an American philosopher. And um, I would like to start by showing you a 10 minute clip of a lecture um, that I gave in um, Zurich at the ETH in March 2020. Suzanne K. Langer is an American philosopher. She was born in 1895 and she died in 1985. Langer spent her youth in Manhattan, born in a German immigrant family, surrounded by other such families. German was her first language. In 1916, she moved to Cambridge, Massachusetts, in order to study at Radcliffe College, the college for women that was connected to Harvard University. Harvard at the time did not accept any female students, but the women studying at Radcliffe could benefit from Harvard's infrastructure and faculty members. Langer received both her undergraduate and graduate degrees from Radcliffe, where she was studying with, for example, the British mathematician turned philosopher Alfred North Whitehead. Her primary, primary field was logic. Later in life, she published a lot on the philosophy of art, and she wrote a trilogy titled Mind, which was a tour de force trying to prove that feeling was the common ground of all human production, aesthetic, scientific, philosophical. It took Langer several decades to finish the trilogy. As she eventually turned blind, the books were finished with the help of several assistants. I met Langer in a footnote of a student paper. Whereas the student mentioned Langer in passing, I googled her immediately, as I did not know her, and I was instantly amazed by her wide-ranging interests and her seeming disrespect for the philosophical canon. In philosophy, thinkers are often classified according to schools of thought, and schools of thought are often seen as mutually exclusive. Think of a logic-based tradition of analytic philosophy and a life and literature based tradition of continental philosophy. And of course, these are stereotypes. Langer borrowed from both traditions as not only was Whitehead her PhD supervisor, but also did she be befriend the German philosopher Ernst Cassirer in the early 1940s. Whitehead started off as a logician and ended up as a philosopher of process of life. Kassirer started off as a philosopher of life with an interest in Kulturwissenschaften, but was often framed in a quite analytical key. Not long ago, I spent some time in the Uton Library in Cambridge in order to study Suzanne Langer's card index system, a system on and with she worked for several decades. The system contains cards indexing all that she has read and cards cross-referencing how readings interlink. Langer read philosophy, biology, anthropology, art history, the neuroscience, and so on, and so on. The system has other kinds of, all kinds of other correct characteristics that situate it as part of a changing world. Not only do we encounter changing gender, sexual, and race relations of power, but also do we see the growing role and place of ICTs in science and society. I even found a dried lavender branch indicating that Langer's entire world folds into and out of the card index system. Out of the thousands of cards that I have looked at, Nana and I, and I chose this one for our presentation, and I will read it to you. Note, mobile architecture. The architecture of small boats is dictated by the seascape on which the boat is set. The Indian canoe slides like a fish. The Norse boat is obviously suggested by the swimming bird. The trireme is a human stronghold defying the waters. The various sloops and junks plus other boats concentrating on the sail are drifters like leaves. But whatever the motive, the boat or ship is the place of man on the waters. Trains, cars, carriages for travel are all mobile housings. 
Their expression is of temporary adjustment and especially safety. A real road car should not look like a parlor, but invite the packing away of luggage rather than its opening out as hotels should and the forward orientation of the traveler. Given the handwriting, Langer seems to have written this card halfway through her philosophical career. But it is not for Langer imminent reasons that we chose this card. What do we read on it? Langer discusses mobile architecture, a term that does not feature prominently in her oeuvre, so we cannot rely on a footnote and understand the card easily or reduce it to some clear-cut meaning. Architecture, for Langer, is an art form that gives to the sense of movement, just like painting gives to the sense of sight, sculpture to the sense of touch, and music to the sense of hearing. The curious formulation of giving to the sense of is intentional. Langer wants to stay away from an idea of art forms resembling movement, sight, touch, hearing, etc. Art speaks to these senses, as it were, and activates them. Being one of the plastic arts, architecture addresses virtual space. Pictures and painting address space through scene, sculpture via kinetic volume, and architecture by expressing an ethnic domain. Ethnic here is not supposed to mean a place of in and exclusion of a people. Langer writes, architecture has its own center and periphery, not dividing one place from all, from all others, but limiting from within whatever there is to be. And she wrote this in her book, Feeling and Form, from 1953. Mobile architecture, we can read in Langer, also implies a mobility in thinking architecture and is not simply limited to moving objects. We find on this card that Langer makes a distinction between motive and expression, whereby she prefers expression to motive. With motive, we multiply resemblances. Boats slide like fish, swim like birds, float like leaves. And with the logic of resemblance, we narrow down our possible frames of analysis. A resemblance is individual. It is my generalized interpretation that X resembles Y. And it is cultural. It is an overcoded interpretation that X resembles Y. Resemblances work with the register of sight. Look, a boat that slides like a fish. Such a logic fixates how we can think about art forms, here, architecture, and reduces how we may interpret individual works of art and our engagements with them. On this register, we do not discuss what the work itself may do and what it may intervene in. Expression, however, allows for the study of precisely this performativity. All possible boats or ships are the place of people on waters, and all possible carriages are the place of people on roads. Both kinds of places express temporary adjustment and especially safety, and as such they are meant to close in instead of open out. Unfixing the way in which we think about art forms, we are enabled to transcend the game of representation and its corollary truth-falsity discussions. We are enabled to be creative with artistic, design, and technological project production. In the words of Langer's friend Kassirer, witness the problem of flight, which could only finally be solved once technological thinking freed itself from the model of bird flight and abandoned the principle of the moving wing. So all possible planes are the place of people in the air. Langer's move from resemblance to expression can be understood as a move from representation to conceptualization. The representational register allows us to only repeat what we think we know about boats and planes and fish 
and birds and leaves. We are invited to project these fixating and fixative knowledges onto one another and naturalize their apparent connection. The conceptual register, however, focuses on the intervention of that what is in the same movement identified. Flight for human travel came into being and could finally be experimented with once the restriction of the fixed model of bird flight was left behind. This is precisely the performativity of the concept. Okay, so there was quite a lot in this short clip. Um, so I would like to now take you through um, a summarizing PowerPoint uh, with a couple of slides um, that take um, that bring to the fore um, the points that I personally find um, most important. So first of all, um, what the story of Langer um, tells you is that uh, is, is a story about gender as a social structure that influences academic life and philosophical production. So we see that Langer, for example, had to study um, differently than um, the men um, that were also studying at the same time in the 1910s and the 1920s um, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And um, although uh, the students at Radcliffe could borrow um, from Harvard libraries and could actually take classes by Harvard professors, um, this was not a one-on-one -on -one relationship. Secondly, uh, what I've always uh, considered an interesting um, exposition or an interesting attempt is Langer's attempt at uh, thinking about feeling as the common ground of all human production, um, aesthetic, scientific, philosophical, all human production, she says, um, comes from feeling uh, or tries to do something with uh, feeling. And um, we can see uh, in relation to gender how radical such a suggestion uh, may be and that um, you really have to um, kind of work with uh, gendered art, um, infrastructures in order to uh, get a point like this uh, across. What I always find interesting too is the fact that Langer disrespects the philosophical canon, that is she disrespects the classification of schools of thought as mutually exclusive and she wants to talk about those themes that cut through the philosophical canon uh, because she thinks that um, such themes um, uh, make um, a philosopher come to the bottom of things, uh, maybe even literally so, um, and, and discuss something like feeling as um, a generative theme, as we will um, quickly see. Then um, she talks about architecture as giving to the sense of movement, as limiting from within whatever there is to be. So she wants to think about architecture in an imminent uh, manner. And she prefers expression as the study of performativity to multiplying resemblances, where resemblances are uh, not performative, but they are representational. And lastly, uh, she sees conceptualization as the performative practice of the invention or the intervention of what is identified. So you see that there is a, um, a kind of double movement that goes on in um, uh, practices of conceptualizing where you in, in, uh, intervene in processes, um, but at the same time invent uh, what these processes are actually about. Um, so how does this connect to this important book, um, Philosophy in a New Key? 
uh, Suzanne Langer's uh, 1942 uh, monograph. And um, I now want to uh, take you through um, what this monograph um, does, uh, at least in my um, reading of uh, this book. And again, um, I will use um, a PowerPoint to do so. So, first of all, Suzanne K. Langer responds productively in Philosophy in a New Key to classifying philosophers or philosophy um, by, so she's not just dismissive, um, she's not just um, going against the philosophical canon or anything, but she really tries to detect um, a generative, she tries to detect generative ideas, that is shared assumptions uh, from which thinkers or schools that, um, you know, come from all corners of uh, the philosophical canon. Um, and um, she calls this generative idea or this shared assumption the essentially transformational nature of human understanding. So according to her, transformation, process, movement um, are uh, the absolute um, keynote in um, philosophy and uh, they precede um, uh, the kind of um, produced thoughts um, themselves. Second of all, um, she says that the limits of thought are not so much set from the outside, um, but they're set from within by the power of conception the wealth of formulative notions with which the mind meets experiences. So earlier I talked about conceptualization as intervention, and this is something uh, that you see here too in philosophy in a new key, um, where you see uh, philosophers, thinkers, but also artists, scientists, um, uh, architects, uh, literary writers, etc., etc. You see them meet experience and um, use conception in uh, in or conceptualization in order to uh, respond um, productively to uh, what meets the eye or the ear or um, what meets uh, movement or relationality, for example, when you talk about dance. Um, so the new key itself that Suzanne Langer talks about is um, uh, it has been formulated by herself as follows. She says the concern is the possibility of symbolizing things and of symbolizing the relations into which these things might enter with each other. And uh, whereas um, she here in this quotation um, uh, emphasizes symbolizing things, um, I think it would be also very important to emphasize the possibility, the very possibility not only of uh, symbolization, but also um, of uh, the um, relations between things, um, so the relations into which they might enter with each other. So there is a, a speculative dimension to the thinking of Suzanne Langer. Um, in order to end this um, uh, short reflection on philosophy in a new key, I would like to um, uh, bring one of the um, other uh, cards that I found in the card index system to the fore, and that is a card that uh, discusses uh, similar themes, um, themes similar to uh, the themes that I talked about um, earlier. So let me conclude with a card from Langer's card index file, a file that Langer worked on and used from 1916 until she had to give up philosophy entirely for reasons of growing blindness and old age. And here I'm reading from a forthcoming publication of mine um, that um, will be published by uh, Roman and Littlefield International. 
The file consists of 37 iron drawers and roughly 25,000 paper cards and can currently be consulted at the Houghton Library. The card that I wish to single out here provides a few of the typically Langarian entanglement of art and life and their philosophies in a vignette about a motive that was found first in a tree living and dying across the road from the house where Langer lived in Old Lyme or around Hurley, and second as the Indian stupa. She uses this vignette to muse on clues to feeling and art, that is, on what is expressed by works of art. And the card reads verbatim as follows. Note, clues to feeling in art. Across the road from my house is a pileup of vegetation, a red cedar completely overgrown with vines. The deepest mass of them is honeysuckle, at present dark green, over that climbing more on the honeysuckle than on the cedar, though of course on both, a wood vine that has gone to the very top and turned down over itself, hanging in a curtain over the hole. In a few places, golden green bunches of bittersweet show through the dark red wood vine against the green honeysuckle and slightly different green bits of cedar that one can see. In front of the tree on the wall is a mass of poison ivy that sends its trailers to the foot of the tree and up the trunk inside the dead structure of choked twigs. This is not visible from outside at all. The whole setup has the form of an Indian stupa and the profusion of surface forms is reminiscent of Indian sculpture. The stupa is a very obvious phallic symbol. The cedar is a natural symbol, phallic in total form, but not only a symbol of generation. It also expresses the profusion of compute, competing lives, overpopulation without the poverty we usually associate with it. It is overpopulation with immense wealth of living form spread in all sorts of shapes over the exterior of the tree. The tree, of course, is dying. Has the Indian stupa with its mass of composed forms covering every inch of it a similar motive? What is the inside of it like? Usually empty, dead. India has lived so long with its vast population that the popular mind is shaped by it and feeling has incorporated it. Art, the composition and expression of feeling, naturally ref reflects it. It has become the basis of style. To us who find it new, it is terrifying. Motive is properly the localization of forms of feeling and actuality. Many actual feelings are similar in form but quite different in value, even to the extent of being sad or happy. Motive is their locus. In good art, the play of values is greater than words make it. There is a sense within sense. All symbolism in art should be enrichment of the art symbol. C. Ivy Campbell Fisher. Judging by the placement of this card in the, uh, of this card in the index file, safely stored in acid-free paper boxes in Uton Library, it was used for the writing of paper, chapter four of Mind One. Um, this is. Uh, uh, Mind is Langer's 1980s um, three-volume pub publication, a chapter titled The Projection of Feeling in Art. Reading the card, we encounter a motive articulating phallicism in a combination of generation, which is a duplex concept consisting of actualized generational classes and generativity per se, and competition, representing here not poverty, but instead abundance. Competition comes to the fore as a duplex notion too, as it ambiguously combines overpopulation with immense wealth of living form that suffocates the cedar, just like the stupa 
that is, whilst abundantly decorated on the outside, regarded as empty, dead inside. Langer reads the overgrown cedar, an actual living form studied by biologists, through the decorated stupa, an actual phenomenon of feeling expressed by artists and craftspeople in serving religious or emotional purposes, as a way to differentiate not between actualized values such as sadness or hap and happiness, but between such values and what could be called for the time being and with the benefit of hindsight, stemming from years of studying post-structuralist and new materialist theories, valuing. I consider Langer's combined, combined philosophy of art and life, a new materialist theory avant la lettre, given that she works from a naturalist premise, and I read her as a post-structuralist avant la lettre, based on the following methodological choice she made. The principle that working concepts must be functional rather than substantive. The combination of new materialism and post-structuralism here is predicated on their shared non-reductive or inclusive premises that prefer to study instead of presume to know the workings of complex material discursive and material discursive apparatuses and systems across and within the spectrum of natures and cultures. Admittedly, this combination of post-structuralism and new materialism may sound counterintuitive for some scholars. The assignment now is to make um, a PowerPoint or uh, make notes um, that resemble my PowerPoint um, in order to, um, to uh, um, um, preserve uh, your takeaway points from uh, this final fragment um, that I read um, about Langer and her um, index card note clues to feeling in art um, and in my reading um, I have uh, not only addressed um, the point of expression for example but I've also talked about conceptualization and I have even referred to new materialism 